Very good. So good morning, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me. It sounds good. Um, my name is Dr. James Lehman, and today I'm going to be talking about DMEC. Uh, the target of this audience would, uh, target of this talk would be uh, cornea specialists all over the world. Um, and the main goal of the talk is just to have you get over that initial fear of, of starting with DMEC because uh, you go to meetings and you can kind of hear about DMEC and you hear how daunting it is. So it's uh, 8 a.m. in the morning here in San Antonio, Texas. So good morning to everybody. Um, marhaba, buenos dias, bonjour. Um, my name is James Lehman. Um, I'm a cornea specialist in private practice here in San Antonio. I do about 95 grafts a year and now I'm about 60% DMEC. Um, and you can see the other percentages there. No relevant financial disclosures for this talk. I've had the fortune to work with Orbis for the last 13 years, first as a doc above the Flying Eye Hospital and then with different programs. I've also partnered with Sight Life and CareLink to go overseas. This is a picture from Jerusalem here from uh, India and here from Jamaica uh, over the last few years to, to help teach DMEC, uh, DSEC and PK in, in other countries. So this is a little overview of the talk. You can see in the picture here how clear and pretty this cornea is. Um, and this is the goal. Uh, DMEC is, is the best rehabilitation for a, a, a defective corneal endothelium. And your corneas will look like they never had any surgery done to them. Uh, we'll be going through each of these topics from background through instrumentation, uh, through the steps of the surgery itself. Um, so here are the first uh, preliminary questions, just so I have an idea about the audience. But how many DMACs have you performed? None. Okay, so most people haven't performed any. So pretty much a novice DSEC, uh, a DMAC uh, audience, that's fine. Um, question two, I have easy access to prepared slash stamped DMAC tissue. Okay, so that's what I thought. I mean, most places uh, outside of the US, um, Canada and, and, and Europe wouldn't have access to prepared stamped tissue. Here's another question. Well, uh, which of the following is a contraindication to DMEC? Having a tube in the anterior chamber, being a phagic, a poor view for the surgeon, uh, iris defect, or peripheral anterior synechiae? Okay, so kind of all over the board on this one. Um, we'll go into this in the talk. Um, some of these are relative contraindications that can be um, overcome with experience, but I would say aphakia would be the uh, strongest contraindication. Uh, another question, just to test your knowledge about corneal uh, preservation. A cornea preserved in Optisol GS can be preserved for five days, 10 days, 14 days, or 18 days. All right, so everybody seems to be on board with that. And if you're doing a combination of a DMEC and a FACO, so kind of the modern day triple, what would be the refractive target for a planar result? So what do you shoot for so that you get zero? All right, around minus one to Plano. So that makes sense, that's good. As we know, there's a, a mild hyperopic shift with any kind of endothelial keratoplasty, less so in DMEC, but, but still present. So I shoot for around a minus 50 to minus 75. Um, okay, so let's talk about background of corneal transplantation. This is a photo from a patient of mine who had an original square graft done by Castro Viejo in the 60s. Uh, this cornea was from a 60 year old back then, so it was over 100 years old at this point. And uh, back then they had steel sutures, they had special knives that could cut only in this square pattern. Uh, and it was kind of a one size fits all for a long time, essentially since the last 20 years. Um, uh, so in the history of endothelial keratoplasty, uh, back in 1998, Dr. Mellis from uh, the Netherlands showed us that you could use an air bubble to stick uh, endothelium onto a, a recipient cornea. And then in 1999, Mark Terry uh, showed us a very technically difficult but uh, visually uh, uh, good result of a DLAC, which revolved, involved trephination of the posterior stroma. It was quite difficult to do. And it wasn't until 2004 uh, when the microkeratome was used to prepare the DSEC donor that we really got widespread adoption of endothelial keratoplasty. So that's picture two here. And that was really the gold standard until um, Dr. Mellis showed us you could do the same thing without the posterior stroma by doing DMEC. And until about 2012, not that many people were doing DMEC across the world. Uh, there were problems with preparation, et cetera. So the beauty of DMEC is that it's precise anatomical replacement. You can see on this anterior chamber OCT, a, cl a clear, thin, compact stroma. And this is a patient post-op day one 
that I did just last week. And this is a patient who has an Ahmed tube that I trimmed here, but you can see you can't get these kind of results with these sacs. So this is a, a real picture just from a few days ago. Uh, you have less refractive shift. Now, what are the downsides? Learning curve, and you got you you do have some limitation in your candidates. You do have to have a somewhat normal anterior anatomy. You can't have an anterior chamber lens, uh, and, and you have to have a good view for surgery. So. Um, here's a chart showing just what's happened in the U.S. over the last decade. You can see in 2011, endothelial keratoplasty surpassed penetrating keratoplasty as the predominant um, corneal procedure done in the U.S. We do about 40 to 50,000 grafts a year, and now the majority of those are done by endothelial keratoplasty. So this includes DMEC and DSEC. And then this next slide shows you the change. Since 2012, only 3% of endothelial keratoplasties were DMEC in the United States. And last year or two years ago, it was 23%. I would say it's closer to 30% now. I just don't have the latest data from the EBAA, but you can see that huge increase. So many more surgeons in the US are, using, are doing DMEC and it's mostly due to preparation of the donor at the eye bank. Again, this is the number per month. Before 2012, it was under 100 a month and now we're about 500 to 600 a month. All right, so donor selection. Uh, here in the US, uh, when, you, when you request a cornea, you, you receive a PDF or a, or, or a fax with information about the, 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 the donor tissue, where it's from, uh, characteristics about the donor, how they died, and then specs on the tissue. And so you read these things and you choose your cornea. Um, the donor cornea selection in DMEC is slightly different than with DSEC and penetrating keratoplasty. Um, you kind of want older corneas because they're easier to manipulate during surgery. And the other characteristics, cell count, death to preservation time, days to surgery, all those are very similar. And we'll go into a few differences here. Uh, just, to, just to reference some landmark studies done in the US over the last 20 years, the co cornea donor study by Dr. Holland and others showed that uh, donor age was not very significant until you got to much older tissue. Cornea surgeons always wanted very young tissue. And this study with over a thousand patients showed that there was not a significant difference in the outcome unless you were really at the upper ages there with 70 plus. Um, the corneal preservation time by Dr. Lass and others, which was just published this past fall, compared DSEC tissue that had been preserved from zero to seven days and eight to 14 days. And there was no difference. All the patients did well, over 90% success rate at three years. but the older corneas, the 12 to 14 day corneas, they tended to do slightly worse, still good, but slightly worse. And so these have helped us to, to use a lot of different corneas. And this is relevant in DMEC because we want older corneas. I use corneas from age 45 to 65. Um, this allows you to harvest it easier. It's not as adherent to the underlying posterior stroma and able to unroll it better in the, in the eye. So there has been a trend in not using diabetic corneas because of problems harvesting these tears that you can get when preparing the cornea. So more studies are showing that there is an increased risk of having problems harvesting from diabetics. But on the other hand, there are many more diabetics in the population in the donor pool. So we still haven't figured out a good uh, middle ground on that. Uh, and I still take diabetics as corneas. So we don't want any pseudophagic patients because harvesting it is difficult with previous incisions. Um, and so when we have a patient uh, with endothelial dysfunction and we wanna decide what kind of surgery they need, we talk about preoperative planning. So the first thing that you have to talk about with surgery is you have to think, uh, what kind of anesthesia am I gonna use? Is the patient able to cooperate and position if needed because of this air bubble problem? Uh, what does the anterior segment look like? Is the patient phagic, pseudophagic, aphagic? Should I do DSEC or DMEC? And so the anesthesia that I use for DMEC would be peribulbar anesthesia. Uh, and what the goal would be is that the patient's comfortable and that the eye's controllable, that it's not moving. Um, additionally, the patient has to be able to lay flat the night of the surgery so that the air bubble points up and sticks, that, sticks the endothelium to the new, uh, to the new recipient. Um, also, the patient has to be cooperative because sometimes you have to rebubble, and we do that in the office under topical anesthesia. And so the patient, I think in many countries, especially those I visited, it's better to take a patient back to the theater if this is the case. But um, if you're gonna be doing this in private practice or in a setting which you don't have ready access to a theater at all times, 
the patient has to be, um, as we would say, with it enough to undergo a rebubble under topical anesthesia in the office. Um, so who's the best candidate for DMAC? Well, it would be somebody with Fuchs dystrophy or with mild pseudophagic bullets. Um, an ACOL makes it extremely difficult to, to unfold the graft. I, I would uh, say that's definitely a contraindication and would move to DSEC in that scenario. Iris damage, the more synechiae, the more iridotomies, the more uh, missing iris tissue, the more difficult the case. Additionally, minimal stromal scarring. You don't want to do endothelial keratoplasty on somebody that's still going to have 2070 vision because of the scarred cornea. Now, this is always, this can be difficult to assess and it takes, you know, some experience in multiple cases to know how much stromal scarring uh, is, pro is prohibitive. Um, also, you want to make sure that if they have a PCIOL that you've dilated the patient and you make sure that it's stable. You don't want to make sure, you want to make sure that it's not dangling or that there's a big rent in the PC because the air bubble and manipulation of the anterior chamber during the surgery could dislodge a lens. So again, you want somebody with a good view, Fuchs dystrophy, mild pseudophagic, no ACIOL, minimal iris damage, a good surgical view with good visual potential, and a stable PCIOL. So this is a patient with corneal edema and Fuchs dystrophy. This would be an ideal candidate. Now these, not so ideal. These would be more amenable to DSEC or PK. Different style ACIOL here. Again, here, here's too much stromal scarring. Even if you did successful DMEC or DSEC, they'd still uh, have poor vision. And in this last case, obviously not much to work with there. If you injected a DMEC, it would go straight to the back. Now, people can do DSEC in these eyes if they've been, you know, nicely vitrectomized and everything by attaching a suture to the DSEC and making sure that doesn't fall backwards. But again, you have to look at the visual potential as well. So again, ACIL would be a contraindication to DMEC in my opinion. A DSEC you can do with an ACIL, but if the ACIL is in there and it's causing inflammation and um, corneal edema, it may be worth doing a two-step procedure and suturing one to the sclera or doing the, U, the new um, intrascleral haptic fixation technique. So in my hands, we'll go back one right here. This case with a PCOL that's in the ACI, AC here, I would do a two-step procedure in which I remove this lens, sutured a, uh, a lens to the sclera, and then came back and did a DSEC. Um, in terms of lens management, um, if you're going to do uh, cataract surgery at the same time as the DMAC, uh, you have to be a good cataract surgeon because the view is always quite poor through these through these corneas, and it oftentimes is the hardest part of the case. The DMAC, you're kind of relaxed and breathing happily, uh, and it's during the phaco part that's difficult. Like we talked about with those questions, there's a hyperopic shift with DSEC or DMAC, and I aim between minus 0.5 and 1. I also hesitate to put in any toric or multifocal IOL in these patients because as the cornea deturgesses in the weeks after endothelial keratoplasty, oftentimes the astigmatism can change. And I've seen patients have a big shift in their astigmatism from what we measured preoperatively. So I would hesitate to put in a toric lens. Now there are surgeons that do it. And if you have a lot of astigmatism and you're just thinking about debulking the astigmatism in a sense, you can do that. But Oftentimes, um, I think it's uh, safer just to stick with a standard uh, monofocal IOL. Um, the question that pops into my mind often is, do I do DMEC or DSEC on this patient? Uh, this is an anterior chamber OCT after DSEC. You can see this posterior lenticule here. And I think that both are very good surgeries. And you both, and, yet, and as a cornea surgeon today, you need to be able to do both of them. But uh, I'm more and more doing DMEC and eyes that uh, perhaps I would have only done DSEC in the past. Things like um, with tube shunts or iris defects. Um, there's better vision, faster recovery, and less refractive shift with DMEC. Um, and I think overall it's a good surgery. The only real contraindication I have is if there's an ACIOL, then I always go with DSEC. Um, if you have a failed PK, I've been doing DSEC on these, but there are many, many uh, presentations at the meetings about doing DMEC under these. The issue with doing a DMEC under a PK is it's difficult to strip the endothelium uh, underneath a PK because you can disrupt the graft tissue interface here. Um, 
and it's hard to it's hard to peel. So I still do DSEC on these eyes uh, or PK, depending on what their best corrected vision was, if they had successful vision in contacts and glasses. But that's a lecture for another time more about uh, penetrating keratoplasty. So we'll continue here. Uh, again, these are eyes, glaucoma surgery with pseudophagic bullets. I, I see more of these than anything. Cataract surgery, uh, at least in the US, doesn't really um, cause too much pseudophagic bullets anymore. It's mostly due from uh, glaucoma surgery and the, with the tube too close to the to the endothelium uh, and so in these eyes I've been doing DMEC and having and having good success like that picture I showed on the second slide um, again you need to have experience these wouldn't be the first cases that you did but they they do great um, as well so in a summary of preoperative planning kind of the checklist you'd run down the anesthesia I, I, I suggest peribulbar anesthesia the patient needs to be cooperative enough to lie flat um, during the surgery, the night after the surgery, and then to possibly undergo rebubble in the office if needed. I think the best cases are fuchs dystrophy or uh, mild pseudophagic bullets. So on that note, when I've traveled to places like uh, South America or India, of course there's pseudophagic bullets there just like anywhere, oftentimes after complicated cataract surgery. And um, the patients we see, they're two, three years after the complicated cataract surgery. By then, it's really hard to do these surgeries. It's almost better uh, once you have access to tissue and you become comfortable prepping the tissue to wait, you know, three months after the complicated cataract surgery before fixing the cornea instead of many years because then it, it sometimes would preclude uh, DMEC and you'd end up doing a PK or DSEC. Um, so again, uh, the, the easiest candidates are mild pseudophagic bullets, those with Fuchs dystrophy, which are in every country in the world, there's Fuchs dystrophy. And um, I would at first avoid eyes with complex anterior segment uh, pathology. Uh, additionally, if the view is good enough, I would do the iridotomy uh, a week ahead of time in the, in the clinic. But I, oftentimes in developing countries, the corneas are so edematous that you have to do it at the time of surgery. So a nice trick with that is to, is to use a vitrector uh, without inflow, just using the vitrector and putting the anterior, filling the anterior chamber with viscoelastic is a trick that I saw in uh, Delhi during my last visit. All right, so tissue prep. Um, in the US, um, when people first started doing DSEC, each hospital would have to buy a $35,000 microkeratome and the surgeon would prepare the DSEC before the case. That would be uh, cost prohibitive in many locations. It takes time, money, and if you damage the cornea, you know, you're still out the money that you have to pay for the cornea. Uh, the same thing with DMEC. When it was first done, um, the surgeon or would have to perform, would have to harvest the DMEC prior to the surgery. It takes even in good hands, you know, 15 to 30 minutes to do. And again, that's time, money, and the risk of damage to the tissue. So now it's evolved to the eye bank preparing the DMEC tissue, and it arrives in a in a anterior, uh, excuse me, a viewing chamber like this. Many eye banks now are putting that S stamp on there to help with tissue orientation, and that's been a big leap forward in terms of uh, surgeon comfort and confidence in terms of uh, performing DMEC surgery. So nowadays we request the cornea. There's an additional fee that's charged for preparing it. And we're even getting eye banks that pre-stain it and uh, pre-load it. So here's an old-fashioned way of preparing the cornea. So I'll start slowly, but this is called a Beckert Y-hook. And this is done under high mag from you can see. And we're scoring decimase and endothelium just about a millimeter inside the limbus. And this is helping to create that initial, that initial group. There's many ways to prepare uh, endothelial tissue for DMEC. And oftentimes people will start with a scraper at the, uh, where the scleral spur would be up here uh, because it's kind of the natural start of the endothelium and allows for uh, harvesting. So I've sped up the video here uh, so that you can see, but you're using the red reflex and scoring all the way around 360 at about a millimeter in from the limbus. So you still have plenty of area to punch. Then you stain it and you can see where the, the um, scoring has happened. And then you use this device called the Moria Microfinger. Um, you could also use a Sinsky hook in this. And what you do is you're teasing up this area so that you can peel it. If a tear is gonna happen, it happens right here. And so by using this microfinger, you tease the edge of the endothelium up 
and you're able to peel it without, uh, without getting that tear. So again, you go 360 degrees with this. Now, uh, this is gonna be the first step for many uh, DMEX surgeons when you get your hands on some tissue to start harvesting it. So the next slide will show the instrumentation you need. And you can look at this in more detail. Um, I can make this uh, presentation available to Orbis, but once you've gone 360, then you start to peel the tissue towards the middle. This is all under Optisol in this viewing chamber. And we try to preserve the central three millimeters. Now, in this case, we're not gonna place an S stamp. So if you're gonna do an S stamp, you peel it all the way to a hinge that you would have here at the bottom. Uh, now you've transferred it to the punch and then you use wet cells to get rid of the Optisol and that causes the, um, the DMEC tissue to lie flat. And then you do partial trephination with an eight millimeter uh, tree fine. It needs to be a new tree fine. It can't be um, reused because it has to be sharp. And then you stain it again so that you can see where you cut it along the edge here. And you're removing this little ring that tells you that you had a good cut because it's no tags to that. And then this is how the tissue is shipped to the surgeon. It's attached here in the central three millimeters. Obviously, if you were doing the surgery, you would do this before you uh, had the patient um, had the patient receive anesthesia, um, just in case there's any problems. So I would I would prep this and then block the patient and bring the patient in the OR with this on a back table covered. Um, and we've done that before in uh, in different countries. We have Orbis and Sight Life. So. Uh, the bottom line regarding tissue preparation in the USA, it's better to get it from an eye bank because it's prepped for you already. It's less financial risk to the surgeon. It's less time in the OR and it ensure, uh, and, and, um, and it just makes everything easier overall. You can see in the bottom right here that there's a pre-stained, pre-loaded uh, DMEC tissue and that's kind of the next uh, generation of, uh, of delivery there. All right, so we'll talk about instrumentation. Um, these were the instruments you just saw in that last video. Um, so I can show you here. This is the uh, Moyo Microfinger. And then these are a pair of straight tires, that Beckard Y-hook, and some Van Ness scissors in case you um, get a tag. Um, patient and theater prep for DMEC. All right, so patient preparation. Um, we talked about doing this inferior iridotomy. It needs to be at 6 o'clock. And um, this can be done preoperatively if there's a good view. If not, it can be done intraoperatively. We talked about IOL calculations. It's good to have a white to white measurement just to make sure that the recipient is in the, is in the majority of patients in the 11 to 12 millimeter range. You can, in some countries, the corneal diameter is smaller and you would make the DMEX smaller. In the US, we use eight millimeter DMEX for basically 12 millimeter horizontal diameter corneas. But in India, for example, it was 11.5 most people. So we use 7.5 millimeter graphs. Um, and so uh, you'd have to just kind of adapt that to your uh, location. And then uh, in terms of anesthesia, we talked about the peribulbar anesthesia. Um, when you're doing the surgery, it's essentially a, a cataract tray with a few extra instruments. One is this reverse Sinsky hook. Another is a blunt eight millimeter tree fine. You need a big 10 cc syringe with BSS. You need a TB syringe with a 30 gauge needle. And you need to have a cohesive viscoelastic like Helon. Additionally, this is what I use to uh, verify um, the graft orientation, and it's a handheld slit lamp made by the company Eidolon. It can be purchased online. Uh, in other countries, there may be other handheld slit lamps, or you may want to prep the graft and use an S stamp. So um, to load the donor, um, we prepare a back table just like you would with any uh, cornea case, and you need a Petri dish, you need BSS, you need a sterile viewing chamber to have the graft transferred into, and you need some tripan blue. And then there's different ways to load the device, the, excuse me, the DMAC, anything from a modified Jones tube to the, um, uh, this I, IOL injector. This is what I use. In the US, it's distributed by Bausch & Lohm, but in different countries, it's under uh, different names like Metacell. But, it's available in, in almost any country. And it doesn't have to just be this device. As long as it has a cartridge that's similar, you can find one in your country that has a, uh, that would work. Uh, I use a, uh, the 2.8 millimeter size and I use a 3.2 incision for that. Uh, so it's the bigger one. Uh, additionally, there's a spring that's present in the middle of the injector. 
uh, and I remove the spring because um, you don't need it in DMEX surgery. So again, many ways to inject the graft. The one I'm going to show in my videos and the one I'm used to is injecting with this IOL injector. Uh, so how do you prepare the eye for surgery? All right, so we're going to go through the surgical steps, but uh, they work like this. First, you make some traction sutures. Now, many DMEX surgeons don't use traction sutures, and I believe that they make the surgery easier. It's easier to manipulate the graft, and uh, I'm going to demonstrate this technique. You mark the cornea, you make your incisions, you fill with viscoelastic, you remove the endothelium, and then you remove the viscoelastic. So we'll talk about that. Um, this video shows placement of traction sutures. They're about three millimeters posterior to the superior and inferior limbi of the cornea. And what they're gonna do is make it uh, possible to manipulate the graft and get it to um, un unroll and unfold. So this is my first step. You can see pretty straightforward there. You take an episcleral bite. The, the main take home point on this is that um, you wanna use a, a tapered needle or a spatula needle. You don't want to use a cutting needle. So anything with a triangular shape, you don't want. You got to use a tapered needle or a, uh, you can use Vicro, this is silk. So either a spatula or a tapered needle. All right, then we mark the cornea. This helps us to be able to center the donor. And so we mark the central eight millimeters of the cornea. And this is just a blunt tree fine, marking the epithelium. And then we're going to come by and I speed up the video here, just marking the central aspect. And that's just gonna help us later in the case to be able to get that graft. Also where we wanna strip with our uh, reverse Sinsky hook. So nothing fancy there. All right, and then the incision. So um, this is a patient, you're probably looking at the cornea saying, hey, this patient doesn't need surgery, but uh, there are gutata there. And uh, the, the, the incisions are just like with cataract surgery. So you'd be sitting temporally over on this right side. And those are the two paracentesis. And then I make a third one here in case I need an anterior chamber maintainer. We fill the eye then with vision blue. We rinse it out. This helps more to stain the capsule for the cataract surgery part, uh, but it does pick up a little bit where there's been some drop out of cells on the endothelium. And then this is a uh, two six keratome that we would enlarge after the cataract surgery part for the DMEC insertion. So again, you got two paracentesis. This is the temporal aspect. So I make them superior and inferior temporally. I also make one over here in case I have to put an AC maintainer. And that just depends on how shallow the AC gets when you're doing injection. So those are the incisions. And then the preparation of the, the recipient also involves stripping of decimase membrane. So this is a different orientation here. The surgeon's sitting uh, temporally, but the, the video is, is kind of 90 degree rotated. But you're, doing, you're going in here with a reverse Sinsky hook. Um, so this, is familiar to anybody who's already doing DSEC surgery because um, we have to remove decimase in, in, in that surgery. So I go just outside the central eight millimeters to about 8.5, 8.75. And I like to go around twice uh, with a moderate amount of pressure. You want to see a little bit of whitening, not too much because then you're just tearing up posterior stroma. And then you go to the distal aspect of the anterior chamber and you start raking the decimase into the middle. You don't need any other instrument other than a reverse Sinsky hook. And the red reflex from the, the somewhat dilated pupil is helpful to, to see what you're doing. You wanna to try to minimize any tears or tags out here, but more importantly, you just don't wanna be so rough that you damage the posterior stroma because that can cause an irregular surface that makes it harder for the, for the DMEC graft to adhere. So there we go, got all that decimase and we just remove it from the eye. Um, here's another case that's already kind of partly way through, just has nice visualization of the edge of decimase there. And uh, we're just kind of bringing it to the middle here, making sure it's been harvested nicely all around the sides there. And then you're gonna just pull it out of the, um, pull it across the center with moderate pressure there. And it tends to wanna come all by itself, all in one piece. It's not very, not very difficult, this part of the surgery. You kind of get the idea here. This one's being a little more stubborn, but if you grab centrally, it tends to all want to come in. And so there we go. Just very patiently with nice moderate amount of pressure, get it out of the eye there. All right, so next step 
it involves uh, loading the donor cornea. So, um, like I said, when I request tissue, it arrives like this. So I receive tissue like this in a viewing chamber, but this viewing chamber is not sterile. Um, so I just got a question. Do you dilate the pupil to see the red reflex? Um, that's from that last slide. Um, in a combined case, the pupil is somewhat dilated from the cataract part of the surgery. I uh, use that and then I will place my call in after removing the viscoelastic uh, to perform the DMEC part. But if it's a DMEC alone, no, I do not use any, um, I don't use any uh, dilation. In fact, we want the pupil small. In a pseudophagic bullus, uh, the cornea, the decimase membrane and endothelium, because it's been damaged so much, it stains very nicely with vision blue and that's all you need to do. In a Fuchs patient, that's not the case, but you can still have good visualization to do the desmetorexis without dilating the pupil. Some surgeons do this under air so that you get a better uh, demarcation line during the desmetorexis, but I find that the AC is not stable enough. Um, all right, so moving along here with the donor cornea loading. Um, so again, I receive it from the eye bank like this, already trephinated at eight millimeters without the S stamp, which I don't think you need, uh, but it's fine to do. Uh, so in this case, only the three millimeters is attached. And what we need to do is take it out of this. We need to stain it with tripan blue and then load it into the injector. So I do all of this under the microscope and I'll just start the video here. So again, it's only attached in that central three millimeters. So it would be tough to, tough to ruin it at this point, but you could still tear it. That's just some heme and debris there. So I, I liked this video because you could see when I let go there, kind of that it's only attached there. That's where the resistance started. So we pick up the decimase membrane and then now I take the donor scleral rim and we transfer it to another uh, little piece of the table. And now we're getting all the optosol off. You have to use two wex cells here because if you just use one, the graft will run with that capillary action. And now we're putting the vision blue in, tripan blue, and different surgeons leave this cooking for a different amount of time. I've seen surgeons up to three minutes. Uh, it used to be thought that the longer that you had it, that it was uh, toxic to the endothelium, but I think studies have uh, kind of shown that maybe not the case. I do it for 30 seconds, but I think somewhere around a minute is probably the best. And then we transfer it in a Petri dish with BSS into the, the cartridge. So a little bit of glare here, but I have some other videos you can see. And then you just tap it into the, into the barrel of the cartridge there. Um, so this is all underneath BSS. Uh, and then now you can see me advancing the cartridge. So that's the plunger hitting the back of the cartridge. And then now you have to be careful not to eject the DMEC. So you have to tilt the tip of the injector up so that the water BSS falls out of the tip of the injector. And I'm doing this under the scope until you get engagement of the plunger into this last part of the cartridge. And then you know it's a pretty stable, it's a pretty stable entity here and you can go ahead and transfer uh, you to, the, uh, to the other mic. You can move the microscope back and, and begin to inject the graft. So, uh, so basically now we're at the steps of the surgery. So this is where there's a lot of difference in terms of doing surgery, but I've tried to simplify it in a way where we break it up into three parts. So you have to inject the graft. There's different ways to do that. You have to do the dance, as I call it, to get the graft in the correct orientation, which then needs to be confirmed. And then you need to put a big bubble of air underneath it to stick it to the posterior stroma. Um, injection can, can happen in many ways, but I'm just showing you here the way that I do it. Um, this eye had a pretty good chamber, so I didn't need to use an AC maintainer. And I got the tip of the injector inside the eye. You have to be completely in the eye. It can't just be like FACO where it's uh, wound assisted. And that's achieved by a consistent pressure with rotation. Stabilization of the chamber here. I'm putting a little BSS into the chamber so that it deepens a little. Conversely, you can use an AC maintainer and then you inject the graft. Now you have to be careful when you withdraw the injector that the graft doesn't come with it. So sometimes you do what's called dumping the AC of any fluid. This, this AC is already pretty, pretty empty. Uh, and you can see when you remove it, nothing wants to come with it. So that's an injection. Um, again, there's many ways. There's the uh, modified Jones tube. 
there's the goiter glass, and there's different ways to do it. Um, they all achieve the same goal, which is injecting the graft into the anterior chamber. And then they all, you all have to suture the, uh, the, the incision after that. Uh, I think you find just what you're comfortable with and attending a DMEC wet lab and playing with the different injectors is a helpful way of doing that. So that's injection. Here's another case that I've done recently. This is in a glaucoma tube patient and the tube is up here. I had to use an anterior chamber maintainer to keep the, the chamber deep. You can see a little bit of iris prolapse, consistent pressure, putting the tip of the injector completely in the eye and then injecting the donor off to the side here. Now, I don't want that thing running, so I pull it out of the eye. I then withdraw the tip of the injector. So that's another way of doing it. I'll show that one again. This is the latest case I did, I think, last week. So the view was poor, so I had to debris the, the epithelium. Again, consistent pressure rotation to get the bevel through the incision, injection of the graft into the anterior chamber with removal of the anterior chamber maintainer, and then removal of the tip. Now, in this case, I injected the uh, graft a little bit off axis so that it wasn't just sitting right by the uh, incision wanting to come out. This makes it a little bit harder for it to come out. And you can see the chamber is quite flat here through the stria and the cornea. So that's injection. Now, the next part after you suture the wound, it's the dance, okay? And the dance has different moves, um, but there's four essential moves in my opinion. You have to be able to flip the graft in case you have it upside down. You have to be able to unroll the graft. You have to be able to unfold the graft and you have to be able to center the graft. Different surgeons do these steps in different orders. Some surgeons center the graft first and then unfold it or unroll it. I feel like uh, unrolling it is the best thing and then centering it. And that's where the traction sutures come in helpful. So I'll show you my technique, but again, there's different ways of doing this. All right. so. The first step, flipping the graft. So you got the graft in the eye, you have a suture through the main wound, and now you use your paracentesis and you use that 10 cc syringe with BSS. And this is called the flip. That's all there is to it, you just saw it, the flip. So what you do is you go under the graft and inject fluid across the anterior chamber. It makes a wave that comes back and it flips the graft. So if you got it in the wrong direction and you have to flip it, that's what you do. All right, and so this can be performed in the first step if you, if, you, if you already can verify the orientation with the S stamp, or it can be done once you've unrolled it a little bit. All right, so unrolling the graft. So this is different than unfolding. Unrolling means you're trying to get it in an orientation in which you can verify the position, whether using a slit lamp or using an S stamp. Different people do it different ways, but there's three key components. You can tap the cornea, with the AC flat, or you can release fluid through one of the paracentesis, which causes the chamber to shallow and the graft to unroll a little bit. So you either tap it or you release fluid. By manipulating the depth of the anterior chamber, making it shallower, you unroll the graft. By making the chamber deeper, by injecting fluid, the graft will start rolling up again, which is helpful if you need to verify orientation using the handheld slit lamp, but not helpful for unrolling the graft. So again, I'm gonna show this video. This is, a, this is a, a shallow chamber, the graft just after injection, and I'm using a tap technique to unroll it. And now I'm thinking, man, I got this thing, that's easy, the surgery's already done, but you have to verify the orientation. This could be upside down. If you had an S stamp, it may tell you already that it's upside down. Um, okay, so again, here's a different technique. So we have the graft, and we need to unroll it. I'm gonna use BSS to deep, there I, did you see that? I just shallowed the chamber through the main wound, causing this to unroll slightly. And now I'm tapping this incision here so that it can come out. So now I have it in this orientation called the tricorn hat orientation. This is what you use when you need to verify the position. Again, I'm gonna show this video. So instead of tapping it, I release fluid from the AC and get it to unroll on its own. Now a little bit of tapping, a little bit of tapping, and I go to this paracentesis, I release some fluid and that allows it to open. So again, you can tap or you can release fluid. And we wanna, we wanna get this orientation. The question is, is the graph like this or is it the hat upside down? If the hat's upside down, you need to flip it. 
So this is what I use with the handheld slit lamp. So the, the tricorn hat can be, it can have orientation uh, in the correct way or it can be upside down. Now, I don't use the S stamp because when I learned to do DMAC, there was no S stamp. What I do is at this step, we turn the lights off in the OR and then I use a slit lamp beam. You can see here that it creates a light beam on top of the graph that you can see these two rolls. If you see one broad beam, that means it's upside down. But if you see these two beams separated by a black space, it means you're in the correct orientation. So I'm gonna show that again, just to kind of hammer that point home. You turn off the lights, you get this handheld slit lamp, and I'm running the beam over the graft, and I'm seeing two distinct lines here. That tells me the graft's in the correct orientation, and these rolls are showing me that it's in the correct tricorn hat configuration. So this obviates the need for the S stamp, which, uh, you know, it's, it's a good technique too but uh, I feel like it's unnecessary. So I'm showing you here on the video, so different tricorn hat configurations, but you see here on the side, so you look with these two different orientations. When the light beam goes over it and you see two distinct beams, that means you're seeing these things. That means you're in the correct orientation. If you see one distinct beam like this, it means it's upside down. The next step after you confirm the orientation is to inject what I call small air. So this is a small air bubble that helps you to unfold the graft, not to unroll it. It's already been somewhat unrolled, but to unfold it. So this is a 30 gauge needle with only about 0.3 of air going in the eye right here. So it's a TB syringe and it's gotta be a good syringe with good action. And you put a bubble underneath the graft and this is gonna help you to unfold the graft, okay? So this differs from people who center the graph first and then just unroll it. Um, this works if the graft is decentered because you're able to manipulate the eye easy with the small air. So here's our picture of the graft with a small air bubble under it and we have to talk about unfolding it at this point. So there's always two kinds of folds. This is called a point lock fold and then this would be just a rolled fold, okay? And so there's two techniques to get these out. So the graft has a small air bubble underneath it, but it's not completely unfolded, all right? So this is where you use the traction sutures to help manipulate the eye position to use the bubble to your advantage. So we'll show some videos here. All right, so this is the rolled fold. This is where the graft we, uh, has this big roll in it right here. And we're gonna use the air bubble to unroll it, unfold it rather. All right, so what we do, you rotate the eye to get the bubble to come uphill and then you create space between the bubble and the, and the fold. And the bubble itself will come up and unfold the graft. Now, we'll show that graft is decentered. So now we're gonna show how we get it centrally. But we see we could unroll it that way. Here's a, here's a graft showing that point lock fold, this thing right here, okay? Uh, so in this situation, again, we use the bubble and we roll the eye, but you just touch the point of that fold and it unrolls like that, so very easy. All right, so now we have to center the graft. And this is where uh, you do what are called golf swings. So you want the eye not too firm and uh, we wanna rotate the eye using those traction sutures so that it goes downhill. All right, so here's that same case. We have the uh, eye rotated now away from us so that you can, golf swing it into the center. So you see how easily you're able to manipulate that graft with an air bubble under it with those traction sutures because you get the graft to go downhill. So if you use the technique in which you center the graft first and then you unroll it or unfold it and then it gets out of position, you're, you're not able to do this. This is why this is a nice technique of using the small air to put the air bubble underneath it and then you can use these traction sutures to manipulate it. So Again, I've seen many surgeons struggle with centering the graft, and this allows us to, to do that easily. So here's a, here's a fold, here's a decentered graft, but we're able, to, we're able to get this graft where we needs to be. So we rotate the eye so that the bubble's gonna come uphill, and we're gonna create space between the bubble and the edge, and use its energy to come up and unroll it. All right. So now it comes nicely. So now it's been unfolded, but look how off center it is. If you don't have an air bubble in here, there's no way that you're gonna be able to get that graft centered. So now we rotate the eye so that the graft is going downhill. So the, we rotate the eye away from us and we use this uh, golf swing
to get it centered. I'll show a little bit more of this video and I know we uh, kind of running low on time now, about 13 minutes left, so I'm gonna speed things along here. But you use golf swings to rotate it. As long as you keep the air bubble underneath the center of the graft, and there's a little fold, but that's okay. And you can just tap at it and it will be okay. As long as you keep the bubble in the center of the graft, you're able to golf swing that to center it. And so this is a nice technique. It works in deeper chambers. You can still center and manipulate a graft. Whereas with the technique about centering it first and then unrolling it only works if you can shallow the chamber. So again, we get a nice center centration here. All right, so after you've, after you've centered it, then you wanna fill the eye with air. So you go back to your small bubble and you fill the eye. Now, you don't have to fill it so firm like a DSEC where the pressure's, you know, 40, but you want it firm, but not too firm. Um, then the patient goes to the post-operative area and they lay flat for 45 minutes. That's kind of the next step. And then we go back to the operating theater and I use a 3cc syringe with a 30 gauge needle and we remove enough air to clear the inferior iridotomy. And I put a bandage lens if needed. Then we, we patch the eye and we see them the next morning. They lay flat all night. Um, this is a uh, edited full DMAC surgery, which is a, one of my uh, second to last slides. Are, so we'll show this. Um, I'll kind of move along through the cataract part because this isn't really the topic we want for this talk, but you can see just kind of standard cataract surgery get the lens in. Now we're doing some stripping of the endothelium. I'm moving things along. Now I remove the viscoelastic. Now we're going to inject um, myocol to get that pupil to come down. We're prepping the donor here, so staining it. Um, now we're going to load it up into the cartridge and you can see this. This one is a little better video. It doesn't have so much glare. Um, we got the cartridge submerged under BSS here. Um, this, of course, can all be practiced in a wet lab, so you can do a good job when it comes time to do the surgery. Sometimes it uh, doesn't scroll up quite as much, and it doesn't want to go into the injector. So you just have to uh, sometimes manipulate the, the fluid around it a little bit and get it to, to shrink up, and then you can get the edge into the cartridge like that. And now we're going to inject it. This eye didn't need an AC maintainer. The chamber stayed deep enough, injecting it off axis here. And then we're gonna dump any fluid in the anterior chamber and then remove the device. Um, there we're unrolling it. Checking to see if it's in correct orientation. So we turn the lights off. This isn't a very good video to see here, but it's upside down. So then we need to flip it like that. And now we're in the right orientation. Little air. Got that point lock fold right here. We need to knock out that point lock fold. That's the next step. So we're gonna deepen the chamber a little bit so that we can manipulate the graft. And then uh, make the bubble go uphill. Touch the point lock fold, get it to unroll, and you get the idea. Small air and then big air. All right, so post-operative care. This is pretty straightforward. Um, we see the patient the day after surgery and then about three days afterwards. It's helpful to have the anterior chamber OCT to confirm the graft position. Um, I wouldn't say it's totally necessary, but if the cornea is edematous, you can't really see the orientation that graft is too thin. So I think uh, most hospitals that I've visited now have these anterior chamber OCTs and I think it's a helpful device. So, uh, Talking about rebubbling, let me go back to this slide. Uh, oftentimes you'll see like the peripheral detachment here. If it's less than 30% on post-op day one or three and they still have a bubble, you can get them to position more. Most of the time this is inferior and they didn't lay flat the night before. But if you just see a shallow peripheral detachment like this, you don't have to rebubble it. Now, if most of the graft is detached like this, then you do need to rebubble. And so the rebubbling, it's like the last step of the DMEC. I, I put a full air bubble in let them lay flat for 45 minutes and then I remove it and then they position again like if it was just the original surgery. Um, and oftentimes we can get it to stick again. Um, 
we talked about rebubbling. If you need to rebubble and there's no air in the anterior chamber, it can be difficult because you can dislodge the graft. So you have to have good visualization and you have to, um, uh, you have to be very careful. Um, I also say don't give up. Um, I've had grafts that I've had to rebubble two, three times and I can get them to stick. So as long as you know the original surgery was not traumatic and that there were no uh, shenanigans at the eye bank preparing the tissue, you can be very successful with rebubbling. Um, some other OCT findings, if you look in the bottom right there, that's one scrolled up resting on the iris. That would be one that you'd pretty much have to raise the white flag and just redo the surgery with new tissue. Um, but the other two, I've had these scenarios and been able to, to get them to, to stick again. Um, long term, one of the benefits of DMEC is that it has a less risk of rejection. And so basically we get the patient down to every other day steroids for life. Um, these patients see well very fast and so they want to have the other eye done in a month or so. They normally don't want to wait like with a DSEC or PK where it takes months to, to rehab the vision. And so we'll go back over these questions. These were just three of the original four and see how well everybody was listening. So um, Lawrence, if you can pull up the, the polling device, which of the following is a contraindication to DMAC? An Ahmed tube, a fakia, a poor view, iris defect, or peripheral anterior sneaky eye. All right, let me see the results there. All right, good, a fakia. We already got this one right, but you can run it anyway. A cornea preserved in optosol can preserve, be preserved for how many days? All right, yeah, 14 days. And again, the CPTS study showed us that corneas are good up until 14 days. They, generally, everybody had good results with DSEC. There was a slight decrease in those with uh, 12 to 14 days. And if you're gonna do a combined procedure, a DMEC FACO, and you want the patient to end up plano, spherical equivalent, what do you shoot for? I think most of you guys had a good handle on this, even before the questions. You can show the results there. Yeah, around a minus one, uh, minus 0.5 to minus one. So um, I wanna thank you for your attention this morning. I think we're running five minutes early so I can answer any questions that anybody has. Um, and this is my email at the bottom there, layman at focalpointvision.com. Feel free to email me with any questions. Um, and uh, this is a picture of Alpamayo, a pretty mountain in the Peruvian Andes. So if we have any Peruvians out there, got some good mountains down there. And uh, I'll open up for any questions. Okay, so Dr. Saw asks, have you, Dr. Saw asks, have you tried head down positioning to reattach an inferior detachment? if there is a bubble in the AC on the first post-op day. Uh, I don't think they have to go head down just because that's so uh, d inconvenient for the patient. I would say I would just fill the AC with air and then leave them for 45 minutes laying flat in your office or back in the theater and then leave enough of an air bubble to cover the entire graft so that if they lay flat, it's being covered. So again, it's the initial pressure and then a large enough air bubble that clears the inferior iridotomy that allows them to lay flat and have that inferior part. So the next question is Dr. Panja, and it says the main indication for DMAC. In the US, it's Fuchs corneal dystrophy, but I think in uh, India, uh, it would be pseudophagic bullous keratopathy. Um, Dr. Paracha says, nice surgery, thank you. Dr. Aljasar asks, Loading the graft uh, in the cornea, what are the take-home tips? Okay, so loading the graft, I guess I would be injecting the graft. Uh, the main take-home tip is to have the right incision size. So you need to really look at your injector size. If you're using the modified Jones tube or the goiter, it's a much smaller uh, incision. You can do it through like a 2.4 or 2.6 incision. If you're using the viscoject injector like I just showed, you need a 3.2 incision. Additionally, don't be afraid to use the anterior chamber maintainer to maintain the anterior chamber depth. As long as you remove it before you withdraw the tip of the, the injector, you're in, you'll be fine. Dr. V asks, sir, do you use SF6? Uh, and how long do you keep a full air bubble? Many surgeons like SF6, um, but I don't think it's necessary. Um, I think you kind of learn DMEC the way that you learn it and you stick with it. Um, I use air. 
Um, how long do you keep a full air bubble? I keep a full air bubble for 45 minutes in the holding area, the post-operative area, and then I bring them back in the theater and remove uh, enough air to clear the inferior iridotomy. So um, a full air bubble for 45 minutes. Now that eye is not tense, tense, tense. It just is a, probably in the 30s pressure-wise, 25 to 30. Um, okay, another question. Um, during rebubble, any risk of graft displacement? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Um, if there's still an air bubble in the anterior chamber, and this is where SF6 is kind of helpful because it sticks around longer, but if you do have a bubble, it's very easy to rebubble. You just have to carefully enter the anterior chamber, release a little bit of fluid, and enlarge that bubble. If it's several days out, you have a detachment, and there's no air in the anterior chamber, you have to be very careful that you're not flipping, you're not folding the graft over with any air bubble that you place in. So again, you'd have to, you'd have to enter the anterior chamber carefully, make sure you don't hit the edge of the graft, go centrally and put an air bubble in. So it can be difficult. Okay, Dr. Pandya asks, any other media except Optisol? So that I know, I know in other countries uh, where you're harvesting your grafts, uh, you use MK medium because that's for 48 hours after the graft. So, I mean, in India, for example, you get the cornea and you use it immediately in the next few days. So you could do this through MK. You just have to use it in the first 48 hours. Um, uh, I just show Optisol because that's the medium term media is what we use in the United States, but you could do this with MK. All right, so the Dr. Paracha asks, um, how much is the learning curve period for this technique? I would say in your first, first 50 cases, something like that, um, I think you need to have a proctor who knows what they're doing for the first, you know, five cases. And then I think you can handle, you can handle it. Uh, after preparing somewhere between five and 10 donors, you can do it very reliably. And then surgically, you just need kind of a coach in there at first to make sure that you can get yourself out of any predicaments that happen when, um, when you're doing the case. So uh, proctor for the first, uh, you know, five to 10 cases would be ideal. So um, um, uh, maybe the final question here, uh, Dr. V asks, do you try to get the DMEX scroll oriented in the right direction in the injector before insertion? A lot of surgeons do do that. Uh, they use what's called the V sign where you can see that it's in the correct orientation. But the issue is if you're using the IOL injector, you have to rotate the injector to get it in the eye. And then you'd have to reorientate that once you're in the eye. So I don't feel that that's necessary. However, if you're using uh, the, the glass goiter injector or the modified Jones tube, it could be helpful. Um, and so it's not a technique that I use, but a lot of surgeons do. Uh, there's many techniques. Uh, I feel like the, the handheld slit lamp is helpful for me because it doesn't rely on any preceding steps to ensure that it's good. As long as I know the graph's in there, I can see if it looks like the hat or not, and I'm comfortable with that. Um, Dr. Zilatidinova Zilatino, asked, what do you think about PDEC? Um, it allows you to use younger tissue. I think harvesting the tissue is very difficult. You have to be able to do the big bubble, and then it could be possibly traumatic to the endothelium as well when you're prepping it. So I think there's a place for it, but if, uh, if you can get, I mean, I, I think if you were limited somehow in the tissue that you got, the PDEC would be helpful. Uh, but I think if you're able to get tissue that's, you know, like I said, 60 years old or so, you'd be set just doing DMEC. Uh, honestly, uh, I haven't seen enough PDEC to be able to, to see what the advantages are. Um, what is the ideal age to do the graft? Dr. Babu asks. Uh, 60 year old would be the target uh, on the donor tissue, I feel. Um, if you can get around 60 year old, it's the nice balance between healthy young tissue and ease of unrolling and unfolding. So yeah, I think that's good. So I appreciate your time. Looks like we finished on time and um, thanks again, Orbis.